Welcome to part one of two of my video lecture, Unpacking Joker, directed by Todd Phillips and released in 2019. Um, as, as you may recall, uh, the opening of Joker was much, much anticipated. Um, it, there was a lot of excitement around the film, but there was also a lot of fear and concern. And some of that fear and worry was aroused by the fact that um, in the not too distant past, in 2012, there had been a movie theater shooting um, by a person who lives with a mental illness who uh, was inspired in one way or another by the character of the Joker. Um, his, his hair was dyed in some version of green and so on. So many of the family members of the Aurora victims expressed concerns about the opening of the film because the trailer had showed uh, already that the film was going to contain a fair degree of, of gun violence in it and and some theaters delayed the opening some deployed extra security um, mental health advocates expressed a, a wide range of concerns about the film um, at, at the run-up to the opening Regardless of those concerns, the film did open. It made quite a lot of money, more than a billion dollars. And at the time, um, it was the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. Now, as we start our conversation here about Joker, uh, and in, in re re I recognize that there are lots of incarnations. There are comic book characters, there are graphic novels, there are novels, probably, I don't know. There were television programs, there are uh, many, many movies. I understand that there's a lore about the character. So we're going to focus our attention specifically on this film um, and uh, Joaquin Phoenix, Phoenix's performance um, in the character of the Joker. As with all of the films, really, that we're going to watch this semester, they're going to be positive and negative um, messages that are being communicated. And that's certainly the case with Todd Phillips' Joker. There are both positives and negatives. Um, you yourself, if you have seen the film prior to this class, you may have loved it, you may have despised it, you may have been kind of in between on the question. Um, at, regardless, now that you have seen the film, you likely have your own opinion about whether it was a good film uh, as film. So were the portrayals uh, compelling? Were the characters compelling? Was the story engrossing and so on? Was the cinematography fabulous? Whatever. So you can form an opinion about the quality of the film as a movie. Um, you do know, you do need though to keep your head in the, the actual game that we're playing here. Our job is not to uh, think of this in terms of movie criticism. We are not movie critics here. That is not our job. Our job is to examine the messages sent by the film, whether it was the intention of the director or not, what messages are sent to viewers about people with mental illness and those who provide them with care. Um, in an interview, with Hollywood Reporter, uh, Phillips uh, talked about the fact that, you know, after the film came out and the, the response from critics was very positive and people kept going to the film and it was making a lot of box office money, Phillips said they felt vindicated, um, not by the, bo the box office numbers, uh, although that's certainly a good thing, but he felt, Phillips felt, that people were really understanding what the movie is about. Now what he's referring to there is the fact, and, and I want you to, to take this to heart, that there are many people who wrote blog posts or um, video posts who are people with mental illness, people who struggle, um, and many who are mental health advocates themselves who wrote that they very much identified with the the character of Arthur um, in the film because he was expressing things that they had themselves expressed. They felt ignored. They felt 
abused, they felt victimized, and they, they also felt that their care was simply not important to the people it should be important to. Um, they also noted uh, in some of these reflections that they could see themselves in Arthur, uh, and, and therefore they found the performance very evocative. So Phillips really responded that to that and said, you know, in his reflection of the film uh, and people's reaction to it, he always identified the purpose of the film as being about childhood trauma, about people who have been abused, who've been traumatized, who were not loved when they should have been loved, who were not empathized with when they should have been empathized with. Um, so it, he saw it as a real character study, and he has that that point of view that he was taking in creating the film. Um, in, in another uh, article, and this was an article that I found in, in USA Today, Alexander, who is a, writing just a, a, an op-ed about the film, argued that the, the depiction is in some ways very complex, and, in, and that's unusual for films with characters with mental illness the character that's been created and then enacted by Joaquin Phoenix is very complex and the presentation of his struggle in his life is deals with that complexity in a, a more honest way than I'm used to seeing. Um, that said, we have to balance those positives with the potential negative impact of showing that Arthur as he transforms into the Joker, turns into a, a vividly violent and destructive person who is dangerous to any and all who might encounter him. So we, that's the balancing act that you're going to be engaging in here as we um, move forward and look at the details of the film. So the first question that I asked you uh, in the film reflection for Joker was, you know, what were your initial impressions of Arthur Fleck as embodied by Joaquin Phoenix? And and you you gave a variety of responses to that. You know, my first responses were, and I've always been fascinated by the the character of the Joker, probably because I grew up, uh, you know, I was born in the '60s. Uh, I, and I grew up in the, the 70s and 80s, and, you know, clowns, <laughs> cl clowns uh, became really dedicatedly coupled with um, horror uh, for people in my generation. Um, you know, you had the Stephen King novel and then later the movies uh, called It, where you had a, a doll that, that yeah, uh, you may have seen it, uh, but then there was the real life murdering clown. There was John Wayne Gacy, the the serial killer, who he he sometimes uh, called his clown um, act uh, Pogo the Clown or Patches the Clown, and eventually it was uncovered that he had murdered 33 men and boys. Um, so this association between clowns and horror and violence and murder is, is something that, at least for my generation, that's a, an illusory correlation that is very, very strong. Um, now, my initial reactions to, you know, the, the, just the presentation of Fleck, um, I, I felt like, you know, he's a clown, but he's not particularly funny. He's not relaxed. He's not cheerful. Um, his laugh, you know, before they they really tell you across the story that he has a neurological condition, his laugh is bizarre, um, and then you realize that the laughter is is organic in some way. He laughs when he's upset, which is emotionally inappropriate. Um, when he's working as a clown, he seems unhappy. He seems robotic. As he's decompensating, and that's a, a fancy clinical word for his symptoms becoming more severe and his ability to adapt um, and function adaptively gets worse, he seems to become more and more depressed, but simultaneously more and more agitated. Um, 
even in the costume design, and, and I found um, a, an interesting piece in The Hollywood Reporter uh, written by um, Keegan, who had interviewed the costume designer, Mark Bridges, who, who worked really closely with, with Joaquin Phoenix in more than one project. And he said he, when he went out to try and find clothing for Arthur, he went looking for things that would basically be department store clothing for boys in the 1970s. And, and I wondered, you know, after I read that, I was like, ah, it, that makes sense because they look like the kinds of outfits that, that my brothers would have worn in the 1970s um, or things that you might go looking, you might find in a thrift store from that era. So what they were trying to communicate there was a kind of um, a arrested development that he's stuck in this late boyhood uh, on the edge of adolescence kind of place. Um, you can notice that his pants are, are typically too short, so and that's whether he's in a clown suit or in his grown-up clothes. He looks like that, that child who has grown taller, but his clothes are still the clothes of a child, and that's intentional on the part of the filmmaker. Now, in your, your reading in uh, Wall's Media Madness in Chapter 3, um, Wall notes that there are some, some personal and social attributes that typically are associated with characters with mental illness. And I wanted to go over those briefly. Um, oftentimes, the entire character becomes identified with the illness that they express. Now, this isn't particularly the case with Joker because they never do really say what mental illness he has. Um, but it is suggested that pretty much all of the people in his atmosphere look at him as an ill person. The lack of family connections that Wall identifies in many characters, again, um, Arthur has his mother but his, his emotional relationship with his mother is not a normal one. Any other family? No. He's fatherless. He has no siblings. He doesn't have extended family connections. It's very typical in, these, in films with a major character with a mental illness that they be deplete of, of family. If they have any at all, the family members they have are dysfunctional. Lacking occupations. Um, for Arthur, he starts out employed, but then is fired, and fired under disturbing circumstances. Lacking friends, it does not appear that Arthur has what you would call real friends. Um, they tend to make fun of him, they tend to tease him, they may do that behind his back or to his face, um, and in one case he is betrayed by one of his co-workers. So he doesn't have true friends in the sense that these are people who, who can support him, who he can go to when he's in trouble. Lacking basic skills and abilities is another personal or social attribute that Wall notes. Um, so basic skills like um, maintaining hygiene, um, eating healthy food, taking care of one's health in terms of good habits, such as exercise or not smoking, um, base, or basic skills like uh, being able to handle money and live independently. So it's not accidental that he's depicted as living with his mother. That's a common trope in films about particularly male characters who are living with a mental illness. They are often positioned as living with their mothers and behaving in a way that is, um, at least in some ways, communicates or telegraphs incompetency. Lacking quote unquote normal human traits is something that, um, that, that Wall notes as happening in these kinds of portrayals. And, and by this, what he's referring to is the tendency for characters with mental illness to be presented as having some degree of sociopathy or psychopathy, um, meaning they have psychopath tendencies. 
So if you are depicting a, a character that has a mental illness, um, particularly characters that are ultimately going to end up behaving violently, what you often sh see in the run-up to the, that explosion of violence is some indication that this is a person that lacks the normal capacity for empathy and care. Um, even in the tiny little interactions between Arthur and his mother, and you might not notice this unless you watch the film more than once, he gets some very dark looks on his face when he is um, interacting with his mother. Um, when he bathes her, he dumps water directly in her face. So there's some of this, this passive aggressiveness and, and even um, a look of intense anger or disgust on his face when he interacts with her. Um, this isn't the case in, in the film Joker, but in some of the other films that um, you will find that have a character with a serious mental illness, or uh, in particular in films where you have characters with autism or characters with an intellectual disability, they may be presented as being far more innocent than the average character, and their innocence has a way of saving other people. And then finally, um, some kind of connection with animalism. Um, the, the way Joaquin Phoenix, and we'll, we'll explore this more in a second, the way he moves, the way he um, chose to manipulate his body, um, tends to be a bit reptilian. Um, and again, uh, unless you've watched the film with a, a, a real intense um, attention to detail, you may not have, that may not have clicked for you. Um, but, but I certainly saw it, particularly the second time I watched the film. So speaking of his appearance um, and his, m the way he moves, there are some ways in which um, Arthur moves across the screen. Uh, and, and again, you know, Joaquin Phoenix is a brilliant actor. He's very much a method actor. Um, he, Joaquin Phoenix reportedly wa lost over 50 pounds in just a matter of a few months in order to play the part, and that was his choice. He, he wanted Arthur to look um, emaciated. He wanted him to look a little wild. Uh, as he described it in one interview, he wanted to give Arthur an emaciated, feral look. Um, so he, he is very, very thin. Um, and you can see in some of the screenshots that I found, he is incredibly unhealthily thin, um, even bird-like. And in some of the poses that he, he kind of puts himself in, you see this reptilian quality um, as if he, it, it, it reminds me of some of those, those dinosaur characters, those bird-like dinosaur characters from Jurassic Park. Um, and then just the way he moves, even when he doesn't have the clown shoes on, when he's running, he runs as if he has the clown shoes on. His dancing is bizarre and, and, and weirdly, although ineptly effeminate. Um, so the, the, the iconic scene on the steps, he's, he's doing these, these very um, robotic kind of disco moves that are if they were performed by someone who was a capable dancer, would be sexy. But when they're performed by him, they're just weird. They're strange. Um, and again, you know, Wall notes that the tendency in, uh, on the part of writers and directors is to give you this physical appearance that is it makes it obvious this is a person who is different. This is a person who is bizarre, um, who makes you cringe. And certainly the thinness um, in the, that first image where he's shown from the back and you see his, his spine is clearly visible, but his arms are sticking out at odd angles. That's what I mean by bird-like. He looks like a uh, forgive it, forgive the imagery here, but he looks like a, a, a plucked chicken. Um, so that suggests that sort of animalism. It suggests that this is a person who is is just close to death. Um, but then you have this this idea of transformation, the makeup, the clothes, 
you may not have noticed that over the course of the film, as elements are added to the Joker costume, the colors also become brighter. And that was an intentional move on the part of the filmmaker and the costume designer to have the colors of the makeup and the colors of the clothing become more vivid um, over the course of the film, uh, kind of representing his metamorphosis. A wall goes on to argue that the way writers and directors choose, and they do choose this, the way they choose to present people with mental illness, there's, there's sort of a model there. Wall notes in this chapter um, that people with mental illness um, are routinely presented as recognizable. He, he tells the story of how in the making of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, which is an iconic institution film. The casting was originally intended to include um, characters who were enacted by actual people living at a real institution where the film was made. The problem was that the casting director and the director, Milos Forman, when they saw the men who were actually living at the institution where the film was made, they felt that they looked too normal. They weren't, they weren't interesting enough um, in terms of their appearance. So they went out and found character actors who had either vivid facial features or they were physically large or tall, or they found people who were unusually small um, and, and almost childlike in their physicality because the public perception is that you will know a person with mental illness when you see them. They will be recognizable. So the expectation on the part of audiences is that people with mental illness will stand out. They'll be deviant um, and noticeable. There is an expectation that they will have a distinctive physical appearance. Um, you know, Joaquin Phoenix has a very distinctive face. And after losing so much weight, he's even more distinctive. You know, he has the hollowed out cheeks. He is an, he is an unusual looking man. You know, he is very identifiable. And that was intentional. You know, Phillips wanted Joaquin Phoenix for this part. Uh, Phoenix wasn't necessarily convinced that it was a movie he wanted to make until he became clear with Philip's guidance that this was going to be a real character study that he could dig into. Um, he didn't want to just make a straight um, a superhero uh, villain movie. He found that boring, um, which kind of suits his character. But for, for Philip's part, having an actor that has the kind of gravitas but also the, the unusual features of a person like Joaquin Phoenix was, was helpful. In addition to their physicality, they are often described as having very distinctive backgrounds, um, like being orphaned or being adopted, being having a history of brutality in your back pocket. So the, the kind of triple threat of being an orphan, being adopted, being a trauma survivor as as an adult um, are just routinely built into these films uh, as a part of character. There's often an association with, with non-human attributes, and I've already talked about the physical manifestations um, of this very thin wraith-like figure uh, being presented to you on film. Frequently, as I, I mentioned already, Actors are selected, and Wall gives you some specific examples of this in the text. Um, actors with very distinctive physicality are often presented in these roles. The, the fact that Joaquin Phoenix felt that he needed to physically um, do what he did for this role, even though, you know, the, the lore about Joker is he's tall and thin, but not emaciated necessarily. He went to that level to make himself even more physically distinctive. And Phillips chose to show him shirtless, um, not for sexual appeal, but to show him his bizarreness on full display. 
Now I ask you in one of the reflection questions, what's the purpose of letting you read parts of Arthur's notebook and what messages are being sent by that? Um, in in researching, researching this, I found out that Phoenix um, reportedly in, in his conversations with Phillips trying to really dig into what did, what were they going to do with this Arthur Fleck? Who was he and what was going on in his head? Um, Phoenix reportedly got, was given a notebook and he wrote the content that you see. He drew the pictures that you see um, as a way of kind of defining for himself who Arthur was. Um, and, and it allowed him to kind of fashion the character in his own mind. He wrote it before filming began. So what you see there on screen is the way in which Joaquin Phoenix chose to define Arthur and to expose his mind to you. Phillips then decided to use shots of him with the notebook and then to build in the idea of it also being a joke book uh, as well as a journal. Now, I don't know how often it happens that you have um, in mental, in films that, that feature characters with mental illness or in films in general that you have these pictures of journals or of notebooks. Um, you know, the idea of a journal or a notebook is something that it's supposed to be a place where you work out your thoughts, where you can uh, write down your most private, uh, intimate, um, details of your life and work through your stuff, if you will, or or just record the events of your day. So journals are seen as private. They're seen as as your your way of kind of pulling your thoughts out of your own mental state and then exploring them. And that's the case here. In we will see notebooks show up in a couple of our other films. We'll see notebooks, journals again in Girl Interrupted. We'll also see it in Beautiful Boy. And the notebooks themselves become elements of the story, and that's the case here in Joker, too. What what kind of binds the... What I think of when I think of the notebook idea, the notebook motif, and, and per, perhaps why Phillips was attracted to using it in the film itself, is this idea that people with mental illnesses are people with secrets. They are people with a hidden self. And if other people could look in the notebook, if they could read what's in the notebook, in the case of Joker, they would be freaked out. What's supposed to be a joke diary, where he's writing out material and practicing it, is really, once you look at it on the page, just a stark uh, description of his very disturbed mind. In uh, Girl Interrupted, it's more of a, uh, a place where the main character works out her difficulties and improves. In, Be in a Beautiful Boy, when we watch that film late in the semester, it's again, we're back to the, this is a man with secrets. This is a man who is desperately struggling. This is a man who's very, very ill. So films will differ. Um, typically when you have male characters, it's dark secrets that are in these notebooks that show up on screen. For female characters, it's a little more likely that they are um, explorations that actually take on a healing role. Um, but that's, just, that's anecdotal evidence on my part. It would be interesting to do a content analysis to find out if that's correct. Now, violence and trauma um, are, are like, you know, additional characters in this film. Certainly, um, violence and trauma is, uh, has characterized Arthur's entire life. Um, you, in the early scenes in the film, Arthur is working in his clown outfit, uh, holding a sign, trying to get people to go to a store, and he is violently, viciously attacked by teenagers in the street. Um, you get the sense that this is not something that is unusual for the times. Now Phillips, in setting the film in the 1970s, uh, he is making a point that this was a violent time in New York City, that this was a dangerous time in New York City. He wanted it gritty, he wanted it dirty. 
um, and he wanted people to be shown as lacking empathy and concern and taking advantage of the weak um, uh, more than once. So adding these layers of trauma, you get the beat down at the hands of children, then you get the abuse at the hands of drunk uh, Wall Street boys, um, and you get the abuse at the hands of um, someone who could have been a friend, who was a co-worker, who then supplies Arthur with a handgun um, that he, he then later uses in a variety of, of criminal offenses, uh, including murder. So what the what Joker has done is to make a, a clear connection. So Phillips in his directing, the writers in their writing, they've, they've made a very clear connection between trauma, and later in the film you learn that he was abused as a child, that he had a serious head injury as a child, and so on. These tra traumatic experiences accumulate. They pile up and they pile up and they pile up and eventually he transforms into the Joker and he kills people. You know, the first murders are, are basically impulse, but as the character is developed, he every time he engages in a violent act, he sees it as empowering. So the, the, the message being sent here is that here you have a person who is repeatedly, repeatedly traumatized. Here's what trauma does to people. People get messed up by trauma. Um, when we get to the film Brothers and we take a hard look at post-traumatic stress in military films, there is often this, this uh, connection that's made between having been exposed to traumatic experiences, whatever kind they are, and then developing mental illness that predisposes the person to violent behavior. Um, and we'll have to revisit that when we, we talk about war films in general. So, you know, the, the audience walks out of this, walks out of this film with a pretty clear uh, reinforced message that violent behavior, particularly the gun violence that's displayed so readily in the film, um, is directly caused by his mental illness. The mental illness was directly caused by trauma. Um, and, and it is that causal pathway that is really thematic in films where you have a, both a, a character with mental illness and a whole lot of violence. Now, family background, and, and you know, I, I say here, more trauma, more abuse. Um, it's very common in films where you have a uh, a character with mental illness who's presented to you as very disturbed, to have a woman who is to blame. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, I've lost track of how many of these characters um, have uh, are men. Number one and they have mothers with whom they have bizarre relationships. Either their mothers were sexually deviant, their mothers were violently abusive, sometimes both, um, or, or they, they are mentally ill and traumatized themselves. In the case of Penny, you have all of those things. So you're introduced to Penny, she's in in the apartment with Arthur, he's giving her dinner. Um, but as the, the film unfolds, you get the backstory uh, and more of the bizarreness kind of creeps in to the depiction of their relationship. So you go from him being kind of a doting, caring son, taking care of his mother who appears to be somehow disabled or, or whatever, you know, he's giving her food and watching TV with her. But then later, you see him dancing with her. Later, you see him bathing her and just the sheer inappropriateness of that when she's not a physically disabled person who doesn't require that kind of care, but he's washing her hair and brushing her hair and bathing her naked. So that suggests, you know, just multiple layers of stereotyping. So, you know, I asked you about, you know, your characterization of Arthur's relationship with his mother 
Um, and you know, why was he choosing to present Arthur in that particular way? Um, Penny, uh, uh, as the film unfolds, is revealed to you to have be a person with a mental illness herself. She delusionally believes that Thomas Wayne, who she briefly worked for, is Arthur's child, and she delusionally believes that Arthur is her biological son. Um, in reality, what you learn is that Penny adopted Arthur um, and that in her care, he suffered violent abuse, um, physical and emotional, and a serious head injury while in her care. Um, you see some glimpses of, of records after Arthur steals those records from the asylum. Um, you know, at best, their relationship is weird. It's strange. Um, if you look at the layers of stereotypes first, Arthur is adopted and fatherless. We have many examples of characters who are uh, presented to us as mentally ill, who are presented to us as violent, who are also characterized as not having parents, either orphaned, adopted, um, routinely fatherless. Um, those are key because we often, as audience members, we want to have a quick explanation for ourselves of how did Arthur get that way? And we want to have a clear villain. So somebody caused Arthur to become the murderer that he becomes. His mother uh, is the handy, uh, the handy villain there. Um, there's also this stereotype that adopted people just generally are damaged and flawed. We have lots of villains in, in, the, in film history who are adopted people. Um, often these characters are presented as disturbed and violent. A second broad stereotype is that, um, and, and I talked about this in the, the week one lecture, um, there's this idea of contagion. So presenting Penny as delusional, presenting her as a person with a mental illness who is obviously not getting treatment, um, it, it reinforces that notion that, that mental illness is catching, that is something you can, you can acquire. The fact that she allowed someone to abuse him brutally um, makes her blameworthy, and by extension, you can apply that stereotype to Arthur. Um, third, the showing him bathing his mother sends a clear message that there is some kind of bizarre sexual element to their relationship. If not overtly sexual, then at least sexualized. Um, where he is simultaneously the child in the house, but also the, the parent. And that kind of role mixing shows up in films with mentally ill characters fairly often. I think kind of the, the iconic example you have is Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, where uh, Norman's mother is presented to you as a prostitute who entertained clients in Norman's presence. And eventually Norman snapped and uh, ostensibly he murdered his mother and then kept her body in mummified form in the hotel where he then dressed as his mother and murdered young women. The themes that, that are the most positive in terms of their impact uh, in the film are these, you know, the, the themes that, that really are very powerfully given to you in Arthur's discussions with his therapist in his later outbursts um, on the talk show are, are real power, powerful messages that, you know, they're decidedly on the positive side of the ledger if you're looking at impact. Um, for many people, they just don't understand the fact, and I'm talking about viewers here, that people with serious mental illnesses um, are some of the most vulnerable and neglected people in our entire culture. Um, you know, since the time of deinstitutionalization in the late 1960s and into the 1970s, um, people with the most severe symptoms, people 
uh, who have disorders like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or other kinds of conditions that lead to psychosis and severe interference with um, adaptive functioning, these are individuals who, after deinstitutionalization, were really left untethered with no place to go. And it's not like the treatment they were getting before deinstitutionalization was super awesome. Um, so these themes are really important and they're timely. You know, when, when Arthur, in a heartfelt way, tells his social worker, I just don't want to feel bad anymore, that's a statement that rings really true to a lot of viewers who've been in the same place. When he says that he hasn't been happy for one minute of his entire life, again, that is a sentiment that resonates long and loud for, for a lot of people who've been in, in his position before of having their resources cut, of not being able to afford medication, or having the program that supplies his social worker vanished out of nowhere. Those aren't fictions of the 1970s. Those are realities today. And I don't mean realities of the COVID today. I mean realities of today, the before times. <laughs> These programs, they're always running on a shoestring. They're always underfunded. The people who provide care, like um, the therapist played by Sharon Washington, the social worker, um, they, they are always at risk of losing their funding. They're always overworked. They're always under-resourced and can't really do much to take care of the people who they are responsible for. When Arthur says, you don't listen, do you? You just ask the same questions every week. How's your job? Are you having negative thoughts? And his statement, all I have are negative thoughts. And then her response, you know, they don't, they don't care about you. They don't care about me either. So what that shows, and it's a real powerful social message, is that you know, people with mental illness and mental health care providers, they tend not to be given the, the positive and empathetic attention that they deserve, um, either in film representations or in real life. Uh, so those are, those are real powerful messages. Um, in, in one article that I found by Anderson, uh, Anderson notes that one strong, strong positive that's been cited by mental health uh, advocates and other experts is that Joker does take an honest look at the daily life of people struggling with mental illness and the the absence of real meaningful social supports and treatments for people. Um, so that, that's that been widely seen as a positive of the film. Now I asked you in your reflections to, to think about um, what kinds of symptoms are you provided to suggest that Arthur is a person who is experiencing a, a disorder that has elements of psychosis? Because you're not given a named disorder. You know, for those of us who are mental health advocates um, and, you know, some of the, the people who wrote pieces about the film, they, they recognize elements of either schizophrenia or um, bipolar, but most have weighed in the direction of the director intending you to see him as a person with, with uh, schizophrenia. Um, you can see from fairly early on, he sees himself in a way that other people do not see him. He has hallucinations about interactions that have never taken place. There are even some who, who wrote pieces about the film. One was a, a blogger that I follow. Um, who is a person who um, lives with bipolar disorder, who he, his theory, and he's not the only one, there, there's a, a, a whole kind of um, internet discussion about the idea that at all of the action that takes place in the movie is inside Arthur's head, that all of it is his hallucination, that the street protests are his hallucination, that all of the people in the street donning clown masks is his hallucination. His showing up on the talk show is a hallucination. Now others interpret the film differently, that those are real events, but there are some things that are clearly hallucinatory, like him having a sexual encounter with his neighbor, him being interviewed from the, the stage at the talk show, him being spoken positively about by the talk show host when in fact he's been made fun of and so on. So you get some information there. 
Um, and as we move our way through the course, and, and hopefully we'll have some chances when we um, deal with the disorder cards for this film, particularly for schizophrenia, that we can talk about how schizophrenia in real life tends to be very quite different from how schizophrenia looks on the screen. Similarly, um, your character here, and this was something that, that um, Phoenix, that the Joaquin Phoenix has been reported to have said was attractive to him. He, he noted in one um, uh, interview in Hollywood Reporter that there was something really interesting to him about the idea of the bizarre laugh of the Joker, which is part of the iconic character, um, the, the really creepy laugh. Um, he felt there was something interested about it being a neurological condition. So Phillips has kind of gone out and found that there is a, a condition called, um, it, it's a neurological disorder uh, called pseudo, pseudo bulbar affect, affect with an A, meaning mood. Um, and, and again, I'm not going to give you much detail about it because we can, we're going to talk about that in the disorder card discussion forums. But for, for this, the sake of this lecture, it is a, a neurological condition that is caused by brain trauma. So uh, it, it could be a stroke, it could be ALS, MS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, um, but it is, it is a result of, of brain damage, essentially. Now, why add it? Why have it present in, in this character? Well, you know, on one level, the writer wants a way of explaining the laugh and he found it interesting to position it as a neurological condition. Um, unfortunately, though, what it actually does for the viewer, if you're really thinking about it, is it makes it obvious this is a disturbed person. So for the uneducated viewer, for a viewer who doesn't know that there's such a thing as pseudobulbar affect, who doesn't understand that people with mental illness are not physically recognizable most of the time. Um, what the, the writers have done in choosing to give him this neurological condition is they've given him an obviously recognizable, bizarre, emotional and physical trait uh, or set of traits that you can see at a distance. If you think about that scene on the bus where he's he's goofing around with the kid, he's actually being funny and clown-like for a change and the kid is laughing and then his mother gets mad about it and lashes out at Arthur and the stress of that experience causes, it triggers the, the pseudobulbar bulbar affect symptoms to, to jump up and he laughs bizarrely, freaking out just about everybody around him who they're New Yorkers. They don't freak, they don't panic and run away, but they show their derision in really unpleasant staring. Um, so the, the purpose of that, and we'll see this in a later film in Matchstick Men, um, which where we'll be considering obsessive compulsive disorder. There was a choice made there um, by the, the director and the writer to say, yeah, we're going to give him OCD, but we're also going to give him Tourette's. Um, and by doing that, they make it so at a distance, you can see there's something wrong with this person um, that they can't hide. Now, Arkham Ho Hospital or Arkham Asylum, um, as you can see here, the, the sign on the artifice, um, Arkham State Hospital, it's a, it's a Gotham staple in the Batman lore. Um, it's where all of the Batman villains end up at some point in time because villainy in the Batman universe is uh, indelibly tied to um, mental illness. So obviously these are killers who are bizarre and weird and mentally ill, so they have to be locked up in an asylum. So the, the, the director has chosen some very um, prototypical imagery. You're shown um, a hospital that's in poor condition. You're shown an elevator scene. It's a classic ho um, hospital elevator. 
uh, with metal walls, graffiti, and an undressed man in four-point restraints who is acting out the kind of stereotypical image of the um, hospitalized mental patient who is being escorted by an orderly and a law enforcement officer. The communication there is this person has to be restrained because this person is a dangerous person. Now, why Arthur has gone there, um, and I asked you that in your reflection questions, he's gone there to get his mother's records. because He's been told something he doesn't believe is true, but he has his doubts, so he wants to get his mother's records. And um, he has a confrontation with uh, the person at the hospital. He steals the records. It, it pushes the final buttons in his transformation. Then you're shown him, he returns to the hospital after uh, murdering the talk show host, after murdering Murray. Um, he is shown back in Arkham Hospital um, having a conversation with a psychiatrist. And in this case, he's in, in hospital whites. He's smoking, he's shackled, he is in handcuffs. Um, and all of those are pretty classic images of the mental institution. And then you have that final scene. Um, you see bloody footprints. You are led to infer that he has murdered the psychiatrist with his bare hands this time. Um, and he's done so in a really bloody way. But you're not, you're not shown the graphicness of it, but the bloody footprints seem to uh, encourage you to believe that there's a whole lot of blood on the floor for him to make footprints of that size. So again, it reinforces the idea that people with mental illness can't be treated and that they're violently, um, even when they're incarcerated, that their violence doesn't stop. So that's where we're going to leave it for part one. When we come back to part two, we're going to explore this issue in more depth of coupling mental illness diagnostic information um, with the uh, the specter of violent or dangerous behavior.